former police officer, I believe that the prohibition of marijuana is one of the most ridiculous abuses of our allocation of police, staff, and money that we could possibly have. The great myth of prohibition is that prohibition doesn't mean you control drugs. It means you give up the right to control drugs. Of course, I don't want to find marijuana in my daughter's room, but I'd certainly not want to see her arrested and with a criminal record the rest of her life. The most dangerous thing about marijuana is to be arrested for its possession or use. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Steves, travel writer and your host. I've found that challenging one's own preconceived notions and engaging in open and honest conversations with others is one of the beauties of travel. In fact, it's fundamental to good travel. Today, I'll take you and our studio audience on a guided tour through the history of this country's marijuana laws. Along the way, we'll learn about the fascinating people and events that are responsible for the marijuana laws we live with today. We'll also hear from scientists and doctors, police officers and judges, and people just like you who are questioning whether those laws are working for us or actually working against us. I've been a medical marijuana patient for about two and a half months now. I started using it because of the effects I was having from my chemotherapy and my surgery after my ovarian cancer was diagnosed. I have not taken any opiates in over two months. I haven't taken any of their prescribed anti-nausea drugs. Since I've been in chemotherapy, I've had chemo nurses who've asked me uh, that I've told that I was a medical marijuana patient and have asked me for information because they've had other patients ask them and they have no information. I think there's a lot of fear among the medical community. I think there's a lot of misinformation. Um, and it's, you know, because it is, a, it is the drug war and, and a lot of people are just scared of, of touching it, just want to, you know, distance themselves as much as possible from it just because of the, the legal issues. Carolyn lives in one of the 13 states that have passed laws permitting the medical use of marijuana. Well, if she lives in a medical marijuana state, then why are her doctors and nurses afraid to talk to her about it? That's a great question, and it's best answered by one of our guest panelists. Joining us are Deborah Small, who's the founder and executive director of the national drug policy organization called Break the Chains, retired Superior Court Judge David Nichols, and Allison Holcomb, director of the American Civil Liberties Union's Marijuana Education Project. Allison, why don't we start with you? Why would Carolyn's doctors and nurses be afraid to talk to her about medical use of marijuana if she lives in a state where it's already legal? The short answer, Rick, is the federal government. There are now 13 states that have passed medical marijuana laws, but the federal government doesn't recognize them. In those states, patients that want to use medical marijuana are threatened and harassed by the federal government, and the doctors that would authorize it for them are too scared to. For people like Carolyn, it's a very big problem. And it's really ironic because since 1978, our government has been giving, the federal government has been giving medical marijuana to patients, but at the same time, this federal government is also attacking state medical marijuana laws and the people who choose to try to implement them. It's an incredible hypocrisy that's caused great hardship on a number of people around the country. Federal drug marijuana laws are not based on science. It's intentional government ignorance, I, th I think, put out there. And uh, Dr. Lyle Craker from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst is involved in a long legal hassle. I finally got a decision allowing him to proceed with his research, but the Drug Enforcement Administration continues to stonewall the research. Hmm. We visited Professor Craker, the man at the center of this controversy. My name is Lyle Craker. I'm a professor at the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences in the University of Massachusetts. Our primary research and educational outreach is in medicinal plants. One of the key plants that we've been working with is, is black cohosh. Currently this plant is collected in the Appalachian region and sold uh, commercially as a dietary supplement. 
for use by menopausal women uh, to relieve the, the symptoms of menopause. 25 or 30 percent of the current medicines on the market are plants or plant derived. I look at marijuana as no different than any other medicinal plant we've worked with. Uh, and what we want to do is, is to do the best thing for the public. And the best thing for the public is to do the research to see, to, to either prove yes or prove no that this plant material has beneficial health effects. To me, this is no different than anything else we've looked at, except that we're restricted. We can't look at it, and that's the big problem. I think that the point we're getting at is that we only learn about how plants can be used is if we, if we do the scientific research that's necessary. And whether we're talking about black cohosh or we're talking about medical marijuana, we're talking about the same type of procedures that we scientifically need to do. The first law governing marijuana required all farmers in the Virginia colony to actually grow hemp, the fiber produced by the marijuana plant. Hemp was valuable because you could use its fibers for rope and canvas, its seeds for soap and lamp oil. Most of the sails and ropes on colonial ships were made from hemp, as were many of the colonists' clothing, maps, and even Bibles. Both the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution were written on hemp parchment. In 1850, marijuana is put in the U.S. pharmacopoeia. Doctors are using and prescribing marijuana in the United States beginning in the 1850s. It is sold by the legitimate drug companies. And marijuana policy remained that way for almost a century. Then along came Harry J. Anslinger. He earned his living chasing rum runners during Prohibition. He became commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in 1930. At that time, it was becoming apparent that Prohibition was losing public support, and Anslinger shifted his focus from alcohol to marijuana. Anslinger utilized the press, whipping up public hysteria with exaggerated claims of the evils of the devil weed. There's no doubt, I think, when you look at this history, that um, the, the uh, enactment of marijuana prohibition, both at the state level and then at the national level, was not based on science at all. The story of Harry Anslinger's role in the prohibition of marijuana and the criminalization of marijuana users is a very interesting story. It's almost comical when you go back and you read some of the, uh, the newspaper accounts and some of the rhetoric surrounding the prohibition of marijuana to see these uh, incredibly exaggerated assertions uh, such as that you know, marijuana would take normal people upon smoking and then make them assassins overnight or that inevitably it would lead to insanity you know, in a larger sense to uh, debauchery and immorality. <laughs> What Anslinger did is basically sort of assemble all these forces and kind of harness all this energy against marijuana as the assassin of youth and use it as the tool for promoting the adoption of the Uniform Narcotic Drug Act. And it worked. A few years later, Anslinger would achieve his ultimate goal, the passage of the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. The uh, Marijuana Tax Act was passed at the national level in 1937 and that um, the story about the prohibition of marijuana was basically a story emerging in the 1930s uh, and largely driven by Harry Anslinger. New immigrant populations were changing the face of American society and alcohol prohibition had given rise to organized crime and increased violence. Anslinger played the race card and the fear card as politicians so often have in America and it worked. 50% of the violent crimes committed in districts occupied by Mexicans, Greeks, Turks, Filipinos, Spaniards, Latin Americans, and Negroes may be traced to the use of marijuana. I believe in some cases one cigarette might develop a homicidal mania, probably to kill his brother. If the hideous monster Frankenstein came face to face with the monster marijuana, he would drop dead of fright. Harry J. Anslinger. To learn more and 